that, they get their first black belt and they, they think they're a black belt, but that's just the base. They become a master of basic. Hey there. This is episode 238 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today I'm going to be joined by Grandmaster Mark Shuey, the Cane Master. If you're new to the show, I want to welcome you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for giving us your time. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the host here on Martial Arts Radio. I'm also the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. We make some great stuff, including sparring gear, and we're always coming out with fun, functional apparel. Sweatshirts, sweatpants, tees, some other cool stuff. If you're new, you might want to check out our boots. It's kind of what we've become known for. We don't do a strap under the toe, double reinforcement, better quality foam, a more durable and yet flexible coating. Really, we just took everything that wasn't working with boots and we fixed them. We've got them at a great price, and you can check those out at whistlekick.com. That's all the, so the best place to find everything we've got going on, from our calendar site to just tons of stuff. Check out whistlekick.com. You can check out the show notes for this or any other episode, any of the 237 other episodes that we have at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Our guest today is a pretty special guy. He was in the Army. He's a former weightlifter, wrestler. And now he's best known as the guy behind the American Cane System. You may know him as the Cane Master. He's Grandmaster Mark Shuey, a martial arts practitioner who specializes in using the cane as a martial arts weapon. He's been through some rough stuff, you know, as a kid and, and even faced some challenges as an adult. And we're going to talk about a lot of that today. And on today's episode, we hear not only about Grandmaster Shuey and how he found the martial arts and how it changed his life, but we're going to hear about how he became such a strong proponent of the cane, and even how yoga fits into his life. It's not a common trilogy, those three, martial arts, canes, and yoga, but for Grandmaster Shuey, it really couldn't have gone any other way. So let's welcome him to the show. Grandmaster Shuey, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm proud to be here. Hey, I am proud to have you here. I'm proud that we've created something that would attract you. I, I've, I think a lot of folks out there are going to know who you are, and I think there may be another good contingent that knows who you are, but maybe not by name. And I know we'll get into that. We're we're gonna we're gonna go on a ride today, talk about a lot of different things. The best way to start is the way that you started, the way we all started. How did you originally become a martial artist? Uh, the uh, being a hardcore martial artist, you might say. When I got out of the army, I used to work out quite a bit with weights. I was a wrestler and. In, uh, in junior college and in high school, and uh, I went. I was working out at Jack Lane's, and I went in there one day to work out, and everybody was sitting in front of the mirrors flexing at each other, and that's not what I work out for. So I was with a friend of mine, and we decided to uh, look at look into the martial arts. This is back in uh, 60, 69 or so, sixty nine seventy, and we went to five different dojos and ended up with one uh, in Tarzana, which was close to my house. Carsana, California, and it was the Chuck Norris system. So I started out with the Chuck Norris system back then. And that's what got me into the martial arts back then. It was called uh, uh, Tong Soo Do. Right. So I stayed with uh, the Norris system for about eight years, got my black belt, and then the main man I studied under, there were a couple of them, it was Harold Gross and Dennis Ichikawa and Neil Citron, and Neil was branching out, and he went to some other stuff with the uh, Hapido and Taekwondo. So I started doing some Taekwondo, and then went got into Hapido. So that's, all of my uh, stuff is, is obviously Korean background. But that's uh, what got me in, was just not want to be a weightlifter any longer and do something that would give me some good exercise, and uh, I could learn something. And of course, you're not the only person to have that initial pull into the martial arts for those reasons but not everyone stays obviously the martial arts is not the easiest physical pursuit it's not the easiest way to sculpt your body there's, there's a lot more to it why did you stick around i don't know I, I felt like a fish out of water for about the first three months and then i started to like it i was you know i was when i was a kid i was bullied and uh, I remember being on the ground on my hands and knees. The guy just knocked the wind out of me, and the kids around me were laughing. He was kind of pushing, and I just sat there and said, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. And I was lucky because my best friend's dad was Golden Gloves, so he taught me how to box. And 
I don't know how deep you want me to go into this, but I started boxing with them every day, having fun. And then one day, on my way to junior high, a bully picked on me, and I'm with my buddy who I was boxing with, and uh, he's picking on me, and the guy's name is John. He said, John kept saying, hit him, do something. I said, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. He goes, you can take him. Anyway, a block, a block and a punch later, he was on the ground, and I uh, kind of had fun. And I started fighting back, because back in my day in school, when you got into a fight, you went to the alley and caught some of the teachers there watching. As long as you didn't fight on the school grounds, they were happy. And then after a fight, we'd shake hands, become best friends, and it was over. So uh, I did a lot of fighting in junior high uh, just for fun. And then when I got uh, out of the Army, and I, I started up uh, with the uh, Norris system out of Tarzana and then went over to the main thing of Van Nuys at that time. Of course, Mr. Norris was in his movie careers back then, so I didn't see much of him. But I sure learned a lot. The idea of, of fighting for <laughs> thank you, the idea of <laughs> fighting for fun or the idea for fighting for anything other than exact self defense is something that might be a little bit foreign to some of our younger listeners or or, or even older oh, listeners yeah. that grew up in in different areas with different values. Well, I just wouldn't get bullied. I wouldn't let anybody pick on me. And uh, when when you are out there having fun, and there's always somebody down there that uh, lost it. See if they could beat the uh, the guy who's supposed to be tough. Yeah. So um, I uh, I did a lot of fighting in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. What stopped me from fighting? I was in, I think I was in the eleventh grade, and I got to a fight with a gentleman. He chose me off. We went out to the alley there, and uh, I hit him, and he had a, a seizure of some kind. I thought I killed the guy. He was bouncing around like a dead fish, and I just scared the hell out of me. And I stopped fighting. I never I didn't do any fighting after that except for uh, when I had to. And uh, it uh, it made me know that I could hurt people fighting, and I don't like hurting people, but I don't like being hurt myself. So uh, that pretty much slowed down my you know, just fighting for fun in the you know, in the hours with with the guys around school. Was he okay? Ultimately, yeah, he was fine. Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure what he had. Yet. About five minutes later, he got up and they, they carried him off to the nurse's office, and he was fine the next day. So he just had a seizure of some kind. They would have scared the hell out of me, let me tell you. <laughs> what, when you talk about jumping into martial arts, you know, you, you with, a, with a background in boxing, and I'm sure you got some sort of combatives when you were in the Army, you, you mentioned feeling like a fish out of water. What, what was it? Because for a lot of people coming into the martial arts, they don't even have that amount of background. Well, number one is flexibility. I had none. I mean, that I putting my feet two feet apart hurt. And my first goal was to get flexible, which I did. Um, I'm still at 70 years old. I can do the full splits three ways. So I'm, I'm stay, stay flexible. And learning all the, 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 the blocks martial arts style, and especially the kicks, to do, do a good kick. If people don't realize that to do a good kick, you've got to hear your hips. And you got to use your foot. You got to place your hips in the right position. There's a lot of stuff mechanically wise in the, in the body you have to know to throw a good kick. In fact, some teachers don't even teach the kicks properly. They don't tell, tell these people to turn their foot, get their hip involved. And uh, um, it was just a totally different thing than boxing for me because you didn't you don't use your feet in boxing besides for dancing around. So um, it was a, a totally different thing using my feet and learning how to kick, learning how to kick high because I was not flexible. I was a a runner and a wrestler and a swimmer, uh, but uh, uh, not a not a not a kicker. That's for sure. Did that change? Did you become? Oh yeah, primarily a kicker. I, yeah, I I definitely went into a kicking quite a bit, and um, uh, I fell in love with it. I uh, once I learned how to use my hip and get these. You know, when I kicked the bag, it would go up halfway. Hold on, so I'm going to keep this here. Chief. Uh, sorry about that. But I uh, would kick the bag, and then when I learned how to turn my hip that extra half inch and get a full slam in there, and the bag would go up and hit the ceiling, I'm going, wow, this is nice. So I learned how to kick properly, and I could kick somebody in the head without a problem after you know two and a half years of learning getting into the full splits. So kicking was uh, was the game because, you know, it's just like Taekwondo, Tong Su was the same thing. Back in the old days, I think they had two matches of had a little problem they separated, but so they're both pretty much identical except for their forms a little bit different. So Taekwondo and Tong Sudo are pretty close to each other. The only thing difference that I could see was the uh, the katas we did. 
and I just uh, I just fell in love with it. I hated cottage, which is kind of funny, because I mean I failed my red belt test, not uh, doing it properly, and because it was the whole thing was because of my cot. I because my red belt test, I was fighting one of Pat Johnson's private students. And he was, you know, three, four inches taller than me. And I, I was cleaning up the mat with him, and he passed the test, and I failed. I almost dropped out of the martial arts. But then Harold came by my shop, and we talked. We were real good friends. And uh, I went back to the martial arts, and I've been doing it for 55 years now. You know, it, we don't talk a lot about those failed belt tests or really those <laughs> major stumbles. But, I mean, when I look back well, on mine... It. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say something. Go ahead. When I look back on on the times that I stumbled, those were the the points in my martial arts education, or I, I guess any time I stumbled in life. It's from those that I feel like I learned the most. Oh, you got to learn something. I mean, look at Einstein. He failed what twenty five hundred times making the light bulb or whatever he made. Um, the uh, yeah, failing is a, is a growing period for someone. I try not to fail, that's for sure. I try my hardest, but every once in a while, you know, caca happens, so uh, you get it. What did you learn from your failed red belt test? Well, uh, I learned that martial arts wasn't about being tough. There's a lot more to it about maturity, taking care of the family, uh, taking care of yourself. Um, It wasn't just about how tough you were. And uh, then, of course, I got into promoting uh, tournaments with Tom Callis and Harry Reyes and and learned a lot more after I got my black belt. I mean, it was a, the martial arts is is quite a trip. You know, most people probably ninety percent they get their first black belt and they they think they're a black belt, but that's just the base. They become a, a master of basics. I mean, they're just starting to learn. And if they'd stay around a little bit longer, it's just been a a great trip for me. I mean, like picking up this cane, which amazed me because after researching it and the cane being one of the oldest weapons out there, there was no system on the crook cane. And I found my niche. <laughs> so uh, the martial arts has a lot of surprises. And uh, I end up, I travel 30 weeks a year now around mostly doing seminars to people. We do lots of the veterans. We have a project we work on that called the Warrior Cane Project. And, but, uh, the martial arts has taken me on a trip that I can't believe. I just, and their life has been wonderful. I love hearing that. And, and I know we're going to hear more. We're going to hear more about the cane and, and the system that you've developed and, and your offerings as we, as we move through here on martial arts radio, it's, it's all about stories. I love hearing stories. And even if all of the listeners don't love the stories, though, I suspect that they do. I love hearing them. What is well, they're your... interesting? Most of them. Yeah. 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 And, and that's really why we have the format of the show that we do is to encourage storytelling. What's your favorite martial arts story from your past? Oh, story, martial arts story. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a story, but it was a, a growing period in the martial arts for me. Cause I thought I was doing pretty good. I was doing tournaments. Okay. And stuff. And then I was going through a divorce in my life and I ended up in Hawaii and uh, I learned yoga. Yoga changed my entire martial arts career. It made me balanced. It made me sturdy. It made me flexible. And uh, at the same time, I was picking up the cane. I'd only been in the martial arts about 20 years at that time. And, uh, the, uh, you know, when I first had to do the cane back uh, when I went for my third degree black belt in Hapkido, of course, I was like everybody else. My instructor walked in with a cane, and he uh, I thought he got hurt. And I said, what's wrong? And then after he wiped me on the mat for about a half hour, I figured out that he didn't have any problems. The cane was actually a, a tool in the martial arts. Anyway, getting back to my yoga, uh, I became very flexible uh, in more ways than one, a very focused um, and uh, I uh, became very strong. It was all from the martial arts. I mean, it was all from the yoga that I learned. Uh, and I was doing yoga about eight hours a day, seven days a week for six months. And it changed my martial arts because I uh, became strong and flexible. And uh, I learned how to con- uh, do more uh, mind setting. When you set your mind to do something, you can do it. Um, just like when I set my mind for the uh, doing tournaments with the cane, I mean, I was pretty hard to beat back in, uh, for four years, I was number one, uh, in about 
four or five different organizations uh, for karate tournaments. And uh, and it was through katas, and I hated katas. As I told you, I failed my red belt test on doing katas because I really didn't like them. And then uh, here I have, what, over 12 world and national first place titles uh, in katas. Open hand and empty hand. And, or if there's an empty hand and full hand. But uh, that's my story is that what changed my life in the martial arts is learning yoga. Jumping into yoga isn't something that, that's, you know, new. I mean, plenty of people have done it, and there's certainly some overlap between yoga and martial arts. We've even had guests on the show who have blended martial arts and yoga into kind of this hybrid style that they instruct now. Mm-hmm. But if I'm if I've got the timeline right, yoga wasn't quite big yet, and you jumped in. You know, eight hours a day, seven days a week. You jumped in with not just both feet, but both feet, head, hands, and, and everything in between. What happened? Yeah. I mean, you you mentioned you know going through some personal challenges, but how was it that that resonated with you so strongly? Most people don't do anything eight hours a day, well, seven days a week. I was uh, got woke up one morning and my back was killing me. I had to crawl to go to the bathroom. I crawled into the bathroom. Suddenly got up, saw some doctors. Doctors wanted to op- operate. I was, I was going through a lot of stress in my life with the you know divorce and stuff, and uh, I didn't realize what the, all the stress was. But uh, you know, like I said, the doctors wanted to operate, and I'm going. I don't want to have the operated on. So I. I traveled around, and then I finally ended up, I mean, I went to Germany, talked to the doctors over there, talked once around here, acupuncturist, nothing was helping. And I finally got into a yoga camp over in Hawaii. And uh, after five weeks of this yoga camp, all of my pain was gone. I did not have any more pain. And then as after that, where I got all my, my world and national titles was the cane. And uh, the yoga just, took me out of pain. I could walk. I could stand up straight. I didn't have to be, I didn't have to have an operation. So uh, yoga saved me for about 10 years until I got hit by a drunk driver. Now I have rocks and bolts in my back, but, uh, and the yoga has helped me again, go getting through all this BS I've gone through. But, uh, putting yoga in with the martial arts is, is, is necessary. Some of these teachers, especially years ago, they hardly do any stretching or warm ups. They just get right into techniques and stuff. And, now, when I teach, uh, you got a good, the class is an hour and a half long. you got 45 minutes of stretching, and then the rest is going for techniques and stuff. The stretching is so important for your health, number one, less injuries, number two, and being, you know, being able to put your leg where other people don't think it's going to get that high. Right. right. The, the idea of being able to maintain your body means you can maintain your practice. You can continue on in your development of your technique with less regression, I, I th- I agree with you. Flexibility yeah. and conditioning is, is so greatly undervalued in many martial arts schools. It is, and it's so important just for just for hell. I mean, it amazes me that this, our schools don't have the yoga or, or some, some kind of stretching program in our elementary and junior highs and high schools. I mean, the last thing they think about nowadays is physical education. And it is so important because you have to do it your whole life to stay young, to stay in shape. You have to exercise. We I mean, look at this country now. I mean, was it fifty percent obesity? Sixty. It's crazy out there. Yeah, I would say you're probably right. Sitting in these airports, wondering how people can even get through the door. I mean, you have to sit next to somebody who's taking a half your seat. But uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, it exercise is so so important, and stretching is more important because it keeps your chi flowing. I mean, I have I've probably been sick maybe two days in the last fifteen years. Because I do the pranayamas through the uh, yoga, which is breathing exercises. I do one I call it's called belly bouncing, where you, you massage all of your internal organs through breathing, and it's uh, it's amazing stuff, and it just keeps you healthy. For sure, cool stuff. And, and folks out there listening, you know, I, I, there are a lot of different kinds of yoga, and, and I'm sure there's one out there that even if you don't enjoy well, yeah, it in the I, way. When I started, there was only like seven different kinds. Now right. they got to, like the martial arts. So everybody yeah. turns around and gets a new martial art out there, which is kind That's of right. silly too. That's right. And we have more tenth degrees out there than I know when I started. Norris was a third degree. And now we've got oh. five thousand tenth degrees. It's getting silly, right. in my opinion. I want to uh, go back. Go ahead. A, a second. There's this paradox here, and 
and I don't know if you've seen it, listeners, I don't know if you're if you're hearing it, but this notion that you at the same time or, or roughly the same time in your in your life, you go from some some physical issues into yoga, rehabilitate yourself, come out feeling better, but then you go to a cane as a weapon. And <laughs> and to me there's this interesting kind of paradox, almost a contradiction there. Is that something you've observed? I, I'm guessing I'm not the first one. Well, uh, about 90, I would say 90% of the population doesn't even know the cane's a weapon. The hardest person to sell a cane to is a senior. They think a cane makes them look old. Um, so the cane is a, you might want to call it a secret weapon. In fact, when I first started teaching it, I can't tell you how many masters and grandmasters in the Korean arts were telling me that I shouldn't be teaching the cane. And it's a... Uh, a couple of them say it was too hard for the kid people to understand. I said, "Hey, it's a stick with a nice fish hook on the end." But anyway, uh, uh, yeah, it's. it's uh, I've, well, I've been doing this 22 years now, and I've probably hit maybe 15 or 20 percent of the schools. They just uh, they can't picture what the cane can do, and it's a medical device. And as long as you stick in your head that it's a medical device, you can carry it anywhere in the world, and they can't even ask you why you have it because of the hip act. Your personal uh, problems, health problems, are nobody's business but yours. So you can carry that cane anywhere. Of course, I tell my students, if they're going to get serious about the cane, have your doctor write you up a prescription for one. The reason that being you don't really need one, but if you get in a situation, you get a prosecutor that's a jerk. I mean, they can say, well, you've got this cane, and, and you've been practicing martial arts, so you turn this medical device into a weapon. And well, if you have a prescription on it, you say, I'm sorry, but I need this cane. And here's a prescription. And doctors will give you a prescription because if they don't give you a prescription and you fall down, who's liable? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's easy to get a prescription. And uh, I just think it's a smart idea just in case you do get into a situation where you have to use it. Uh, there'll be no repercussions from the, uh, from the legal side of it, my opinion, anyway. I, I am certainly not an expert or even... I wouldn't even call myself a novice in using the cane, but I have long advocated for people to explore it as a weapon. We've talked about it on this show because it is, I, I can't speak to the regulations outside the United States, but within the U.S., it is the only martial arts weapon we have that is federally supported. Everything else we hey. do is prohibited. This is federally supported as being able oh, to be carried oh. anywhere. All the countries, I mean, I go to Europe all the time, and I have no problem. In fact, I carry a case around with four canes, real nice canes in my case, plus my other ones. And, I mean, especially in over in, in England, I mean, they question about all this stuff, getting on the plane, and they said, what do you got there? And I said, canes, and they just passed right by it like there's it it nothing. And it's, uh, you know, you can get a cane going over 250 miles an hour in a half a second's time. It is a hell of a tool. And uh, you, yeah, they can't pay it to, because if the, if somebody takes a cane from you, know, security, and you trip and fall, they're liable. They've got a problem. I was in the courtroom. Here's a here's the martial arts story for you. I was in the court, courtroom testifying, and the judge goes, "What do you do?" And I said, "Sir, I'm a professional martial artist." He goes, "Really? What do you teach?" And I said, "I had my cane on the table where I was, you know, up the front there." And uh, I said, "I teach people how to use a cane for self defense." And they go, really? And I said, yeah. And the three security guards inside the courtroom walked over to me, one of them picked the cane up and started walking away. And I said, I hope I don't fall, sir, because you'll be in a lawsuit. <laughs> he looked at the judge, the judge smiled, and he put the cane back on my table. So the cane is a medical device, and everybody recognizes it. And uh, they have a lot of things saying, well, if you have all these, you know, notches and stuff on there. I, I have an exercise system with the cane. So I have notches. I call them shark teeth. And when I'm in front of security, I call them uh, notches for my exercise system, for my exercise band, which is true. It also makes a, big, a great back scratcher. So um, I have other ideas for all these little things I put on the canes. And then they all have a reason why they're medically and physically. So I have no problem getting my canes through any airport. I've never been hassled anywhere in the world. And I've traveled through Asia, through Canada. Uh, I have not been to Australia yet, but I'm working on that. But I'll be going to uh, Europe again next year, sell through the UK. And uh, as long as you tell people that it's a medical device and you 
or have balance issues or a sore ankle or whatever it happens to be, um, you can carry that cane anywhere you want. Once you say, oh, it's for self-defense, it's no longer a cane, it's no longer a medical device. It's a weapon. So that's the first thing I install into my student's brain is he never say anything besides this thing is helping you get around. That makes sense to you? Absolutely. And hopefully it's making sense to everybody out there. It's, it's, I, oh, I forget it's, who and, explained the concept of the cane to me, but once I heard it and, and you know, very much what you're saying now, it kind of blew my mind because there's nothing else yep. out there like it. You're right. I mean, when I, when I sat down and discovered the cane, I was visiting my brother in Palm Springs. And this is what got me started into it. And the, the weekend I was there, three ladies over the age of 65 were brutally attacked. Two of them had canes, didn't know what they had in their hand. So I started researching it, so I wanted to get a, a good fighting cane. I couldn't find anybody making fighting canes. And I was, at that time, I was a general contractor with 91 employees, so Lord knows I was doing okay. But I said, well, I'll, I'll make a cane. And then I started making canes, and I started playing with it. And I said, well, maybe I can make these canes and sell them. And then I started doing really good in the tournament circuit. And, and then one guy comes up to me and goes, how can I become a cane master? And I said, Jesus, that's a good question. So I had to devise a, uh, a cane system. So uh, three years later, I have a complete system. And uh, then we re- revised the system. So now we have belts going all the way up to 10th Street Black. It's uh, recognized in most countries around the world. And um, I'm just having fun out there. But this, it's so hard to get the cane out to the general public because they think it's a crutch and they think it makes them look old or it makes them look weak. And after we do a class with uh, with me, within a half hour, most people, <laughs> one of the one funniest thing is one of the veterans we tell, he goes, I'm going to put a $100 bill in my pocket so people can see it, and I'm going to go walk in the park tonight. <laughs> Test this cane out. So, it's, I mean, it's a hell of a tool. And there are thousands of techniques. There's 26 different ways to hold a cane. So, uh, and each one different way you hold the cane, you can do different techniques with it. So, it's a hell of a tool. It certainly is. It's pretty clear to anybody listening right now that you're passionate about the martial arts. You're passionate about sharing <laughs> what you know. Is I there sure. time and space in your life for, for non-martial arts things? Are there hobbies? Are there, is there anything that draws your attention away? I love to hike. I live in Lake Tahoe, which is God's country, and I try to hike three or four days a week for a few hours because it's good for you, and the views are breathtaking. So I'd say that'd be my number one thing to do. Um, and I swim. In fact, I just got back from swimming, so I try to swim three or four days a week just to stay healthy and in shape. But uh, martial arts is number one, that's for sure. Um, and then I hike. When I hike, I take my dogs with me and my kids, dogs, and everybody else. I usually have around four dogs when I go hiking, so nobody bothers me. Of course, when you hike around here, very seldom do I run into people that I hike with people don't know about. I mean, I can leave my back door and go all the way to Reno, which is about a 25-mile hike, and I wouldn't even see another house if I went the right direction. Mm. So I just love to hike. I love to look at the beauty of things. Um, hobbies, I collect coins. I've been doing that since I was 12. And um, going out there, I do enjoy food. In fact, if I didn't, ex- if I didn't exercise, <laughs> I'd weigh 500 pounds. Uh, I do, do like to enjoy good food. And the lady that I'm with, uh, Lynn, she's probably one of the best cooks in the world. She used to have a catering service. Well, that's a good So um, I, I do know how to eat. <laughs> but, uh, but which I, and exercising is so important to you know, keep you healthy sure. and keep you young. That's what keeps you young is exercising. What's your favorite meal uh, that Lynn cooks? What's your oh, favorite meal of hers? I don't know. I uh, She just... I'll walk and I'll look in the refrigerator and go, Christ, you got nothing to eat in this refrigerator. We got to go out tonight. And she goes, no, we don't. And she'll sit down and make some kind of stuff and put all these ingredients in. And it's just delicious. But, uh, she's amazing at doing that. I can't talk right now. Um, and, um, anything she cooks is good. I'm, I'm a, I'm a steak man myself. I like to barbecue. So I, I try to barbecue, you know, three or four days a week all different kinds of meats. But uh, her favorite dish, got, she got so many, I can't nail it down to just one. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. I, w- I, won't, I won't make you. <laughs> I, won't, I won't sit on you and make you do that. You total 
told us a little bit about a challenging time, you know, your, your divorce and, and how that led you to yoga. So maybe we'll talk about this time. Maybe we'll talk about another time. But one of the things that I love when talking to martial artists is how they use their martial arts, whether it's the physical practice or, or, or the mental practice, as they go through difficult times. I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life that things weren't going well and how you were able to use your martial arts to get through it. Well, then we were going right back uh, to, the, uh, to the major divorce that I was in. And um, it was, I mean, it was terrible. She went through five attorneys. And uh, I uh, ended up uh, trying to get, get to get out of here. And that's when I decided to go to Hawaii. And uh, I just uh, started doing yoga. And as I said, eight, oh, yoga eight hours a day was true. But I also spent another four hours a day uh, picking up the cane. That's when I first picked up the cane back in the, uh, in the early 90s. And I started playing with that. And uh, just not having to think about what, what my personal life was doing, uh, all my, uh, cause at that time I had 11 houses, et cetera, et cetera. And I did my whole, it was still you know, falling apart. And I just got totally into martial arts and totally into to yoga. And uh, that's just probably the best thing I ever did for myself. Cause I'm, uh, they say if you have a, uh, a job that you're in love with, you don't work a day in your life. And that is so true. Because, I mean, I travel 30 weeks a year here and there all around the United States and, and anytime I get invited overseas. And uh, uh, not one day a, a week do I ever work. It's all fun. And I'm having a ball. So I don't know if I explained that very well, but uh, it just uh, kept me busy, kept me exercising. In fact, I went over there in three months. I didn't even know it, and I lost 35 pounds. And I thought I was in good shape when I went over there. Wow. So uh, I was, ex- I, you know. They tried to get me to be a vegetarian. <laughs> the, the yoga camp that I was in, you were not allowed to have meat there at all. I would sneak away maybe one day a week, and, and I used to uh, love Korean food, so I'd sneak off to Korean barbecues and stuff. But uh, living for about six months on very little meat and lots of vegetables was good, but I, I loved meat, so I had to get back to it. <laughs> yoga and vegetarianism does seem to go well together. I'm not, I'm not uh-huh. sure why, but... You know, they, the the two have been married up for quite a long time. Yes, they have. I, mean, I had one lady because I drink coffee. She said that I wasn't a yogi. I said, well, let's go through a little workout here. And she couldn't do anything at all. And she said, but she just said, because I drink coffee, I'm not a yogi. I said, you know, tea's got caffeine in it. I just like coffee, but I like tea. Uh, so it's, it's silly. Some of these, what these yogis I call them, think about. In fact, we've had some, I remember going over to Tom Callis. You probably heard of him. Mm-hmm. He went to a studio. He was in Hawaii, and I went over there, and he hired a lady to come and do yoga, and the lady came into the dojo, and she looked around, and she says, I'm sorry, but the energy here is bad. I can't teach yoga in this in this building, which it, it, to me is a total joke. I mean, my goodness, it's not the, the, it, the dojo's energy, it's her energy. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm not a full-fledged yogi per se, but I do yoga every day. Well, you're a yogi who drinks coffee and eats steak. That's it. And, and, <laughs> and I think that's just, as someone who doesn't eat steak, I see no problem with you eating steak. <laughs> well, thank you. You're, you're, my opinion means I'm absolutely jack, but, you know, I'll still offer it. <laughs> yeah. if, if I was to ask you who the most influential person on your martial arts has been, who would that be? Influential person. Um, one who helped me was Ron Ballas. He died last year. He was great. We would sit and talk for hours. He was a hell of a martial artist. He was a you know a veteran for the Korean War and stuff. He uh, he taught me a lot of stuff. Uh, just just mentally going through that. Um, as far as anybody who uh, slapped me in the face as being a uh, mentor and stuff. Um, I guess it would have been, uh, I have to say Master Norris because I, that's the school that I started and he, uh, he's the one, his school's the one that got me into the martial arts. And, uh, um, so, uh, and one of my teacher, Harold Gross and Neil Citron, they were very big influences on me. Um, 
And I guess going to a few of uh, Bill uh, Bill Wallace's tournaments. I mean, I know Bill real well. I've been doing fence for over thirty years, and uh, he taught me how to give good stretching uh, seminars and make it fun. So I guess there's not one person, but there's a group of people that helped me get through this martial arts. Those are the ones. And now if you could train with somebody that wasn't in that list, somebody you've never trained with, and they can be anywhere in the world, they can even be passed away, who would you have wanted to train with? Or or who would you? I mean, they, they could still be alive, and there's still an opportunity. Huh. I mean, I uh, I like working out with Eric Lee. Uh, we're very good friends too. Eric Lee, uh, uh, Don the Dragon. He's he's a hell of a martial artist. Um, God, you know, you go down a the list. There's so many. There's so many that are good, and they're all they all have their little secrets. That's what I love about teaching the cane. When you go to different schools, you get a little bit of taste of. Every martial artist got a little bit of a different twist to it and stuff, and they're all a little different, and they're all good. So uh, going uh, to one person that, would, that I would go work out with, I can't say one. I had to you know put a few in there. Even you know Mike De Pasquale, he's great. He uh, does stuff. Uh, I love uh, I love the Wallace system. Um, uh, Lewis Joe Lewis was excellent. I only got to do a few of his seminars he was a he was an amazing fighter so um i've I, you know i've done so many different seminars with people in the last 30 years it's uh it's all good i i can't uh, just i just can't pick out one person because they all have their little mix and, and trips it's quite all right the way you answer the questions even if they're complete departures from what i ask tells you tells us <laughs> it, a, a, a lot and and that's okay it's that's why i love this format you mentioned competition you mentioned about competing doing forums with the cane were you doing yeah. other things were you were you fighting in tournaments uh, to tell us oh, a bit about your I, competitive time it's it's funny yeah i was definitely a fighter uh, that's what you know Norris system was all about was fighting um, he did have katas in the system, but I obviously didn't catch on to the katas. And um, I, I loved, uh, I was a, a fighter. I, I did fighting in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and then what got me into katas was the cane. And I started doing a few katas, you know, bow katas and, and, and nunchucks, a little bit of that stuff. But then when I got the cane in my hand, I just totally changed. And, uh, um, it was, it was amazing. And the one who really got me into the cane was my son, Mark Jr. And he, uh, he got me doing it after I started doing it with, uh, Master Neil Citron. He was the first one to taught me the techniques about the cane. And then I just, uh, I, I went, the cane was in me. That's what I was. I was, I was known now as the cane master. And I just, uh, I fell in love with the cane. And I'm, I'm here on this planet. This is my job is to get the cane out to people. And that's what I do. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a weird story that's strange. I told a few people, but I was in my backyard, and this is 20 years ago, making a cane for a customer. And it was 1130 at night, and I wasn't drinking or smoking. And this light came over me and told me that that's what I was here for is to get the cane out to people. At that time, like I told you, I was a general contract with 91 employees. And I paid attention. I mean, it scared the hell out of me. I don't know if being scared is the right word, but it slapped me right in the face. And uh, I, I, I 100% into the cane from that time on. I got all my men uh, that I had employed in construction. I got them all new jobs, and I uh, just started doing martial arts and canes. That was it. It can be difficult for a lot of people to believe, to swallow stories like that but that's what makes them powerful and even if well it's hard for other... me to swallow i mean I, sure. yeah I, 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 uh, it, uh, i'm not religious i'm very spiritual but i'm not religious at all so it would I mean when that that light came over me it, it it slapped me in the face and i uh paid attention to it yeah well if, if that was a, if it was a common occurrence it probably wouldn't have changed your life you know, if, if a dog walks by and poops on your front yard, that's probably not going to change your life. But if you've never seen a dog before, if they don't exist in your world, 
well, that that's a significant thing. And, and what you're describing is to me is the same thing. It's something that yeah, is powerful it was, because it's unbelievable. Yeah, it was, it was definitely powerful. And that's, I've been doing that king 100% ever since that day. Are yeah, there any uh, hard. Go ahead. Are there any memorable students? Is there is any stories from teaching people cane that that come to mind? Comical stories or serious stories? Did anybody do anything remarkable while you were working with them? Well, there's one gentleman. His name is Michael Patterson. Uh, when I met him over the phone, it was uh, I was just about to leave, and uh, he was in Florida. He was the chief of, uh, I think it's Putnam County, uh, EMT and fire. And he wanted to get, uh, he didn't do anything about a cane at that time. And, uh, I, I talked him into a gentleman's cane. Um, he was doing, uh, some school stuff. He had some projects he had to do with, uh, um, with his work. And, uh, he fell in love with the cane too. And he, has been an amazing gentleman getting the cane out to all of Florida and part of uh, uh, North Carolina. He is teaching police departments. We have a little thing called Cane Fu, and it's uh, kind of a beginning for the cane to wake up people who know the cane is not a crutch. And he's teaching police departments, and the police departments are going around. We've only done five so far, but this is on our agenda to do a lot more. But uh, he teaches the police departments. The police departments are going to senior citizen centers, and they're teaching seniors how to protect themselves with a cane because they're being attacked out there left and right. I mean, these thugs nowadays, look at this knockout game they have going on and stuff. But if they think someone is vulnerable, uh, especially if they have a cane, and you, you look at people that, that haven't taken my class or walk with a cane, most of the time their head's looking down and they're, and they're not moving very fast. And after they do one of my classes, their heads up straight and they're looking around because they're now aware. And uh, it's a whole different process, but uh, now I'm losing my track here. But uh, Michael Patterson has been teaching police departments and fire departments, and he's taken the whole state of Florida and turning it around and, and, uh, and, and doing an amazing job teaching the cane to our uh, government, government-type employees mm-hmm. and waking them all up. Let them know the cane's not a crutch. So Michael Patterson and I say I gotta pat him on the back. He's been a a, a great person at fixing the pain and stuff. I have a lot of students out there that are that are doing a great job. Um, I have some physical therapists. They're they're doing uh, the K and they're teaching it to their uh, their patients because it's getting rid of stress. And I mentioned before about the the, the Warrior Cane project we have with. We give the, the warrior cane, the, the, they have to be a veteran, and we give them a custom wood cane that we sell over the Internet for over $200. They get one for free, and then we go out and teach them anywhere in the United States, but they have to have groups of 25, and we, teach, uh, we give them three hours of training with the cane, all for free, and we fly out there for free, but they have to have groups, like I said, of 25. But uh, getting that project, the man who started that project was Tom Foreman, he is a one hell of a gentleman. He's a little guy, about six foot five, solid muscle, two hundred seventy five pounds. But he's the one that started the Warrior Cane Project, and uh, we're we've helped over eight hundred and fifty veterans. So Tom Foreman, I had to put in there. He started a project up that has helped so many people. It's uh, it's amazing what he's done for veterans, especially, and uh, and anybody, anybody else he runs into. So those are two big names that really helped the cane masters, which is the name of my company, uh, to get out there and and help people. That's great. I'm seeing more and more people step up, companies step up and offer their support to veterans directly or through other organizations. There's a lot of good work that martial arts and martial artists are doing for people all over the world and all all types. But I, I think for many of us, there's a particularly soft place in our heart, maybe I shouldn't speak for others. I can speak for myself. I know that it it really resonates for me when I see folks working with veterans because I think uh, you know, I, I never served. Oh, it, but it's it, it's a group that it I think is. is ignored at times. It is, and when you teach your people that they're missing limbs, and you get them out there, and they're wondering why they're there when they when they 
come over there, and then within a half hour, you can see their their light come back in their eyes, and they got a smile on their face, and they understand that the the crutch that they're carrying around is no longer a crutch. It's a, a billy club with a meat hook, and you can carry it anywhere in the world. <laughs> and learning how to use it is not hard. It's not rocket science. It's only a stick. But uh, there's so many things you can do with that stick. A billy club with a meat hook. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> are you at all a fan of martial arts movies? A few. Are. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I. Uh, I guess End of the Dragon. Everybody's watched that one. Um, Steven Seagal. I think he comes out with some good movies. He hasn't been around lately, I guess. But uh, and and of course, uh, Chuck Norris. Uh, that's funny because when he first started, some of his movies were pretty silly. But uh, when he got into the Texas Ranger stuff, he he did that very, very well. So, uh, uh, do I watch a bunch of martial arts movies? Uh, yes and no. It depends. I don't watch too much TV anymore. Just, I just stay away from it. And I'm either making canes or trying to teach people how to use them, or eating delicious food, or hiking. Oh, then that too. We got to eat. So <laughs> might, might as well eat something delicious. Why eat right. something that tastes good? Completely agree. But yeah, I, I might. I, my pleasure now is making canes, and I there's you know it's amazing how many different ways that you can make a cane work. And so you know, all the canes start out the same. It's like the human body. Everybody looking a little different. Do the same thing with canes. And what I've also started on check of a look at my website. You can design your own cane. So I give you a whole bunch of different options, and I would say probably 80% of the canes that I sell now are designed by the customer. Oh, okay. I help them design it, of course, and they they and now you don't have to walk around with a piece of aluminum crap uh, that makes it look old. They walk around with a nice custom wood cane that they've designed and uh, that I've put together for them. And uh, that is really uh, it's made made my job a lot more fun because these people who get the ideas they want to can they design a cane that fits them perfectly and uh it's something when most people have to use a cane they have to do it for the rest of their life so why walk around with aluminum thing that makes you look you know geriatric anyway to a nice piece that uh a lot of people say it's a work of art so uh, uh you're making the canes and then teaching people how to use them has really changed my life and they're nothing but positiveness hmm. We've talked a lot about the cane. We've talked a lot about why it's important to you and, and, and even some, some outside validation for the cane. But as you look forward, you know, over the next however many years you're going to choose to keep teaching people about the cane, what are your goals? Is there, you, you mentioned 15 to 20% of schools. Is there a, a number of schools you're trying to reach or a number of people you're, you're trying to teach? Well, uh, believe it or not, I'm trying to get canes also in the hospitals. Um, the, the most hospitals, they hand a person a cane and say, here, learn how to lift. They don't even tell them which side to carry a cane on. Of course, that's hard to do them because every injury is a little bit different, so you have to carry it. Everybody has to carry it a little bit different. But I'd like to see, uh, uh, especially seniors, you know that 30% of seniors over the age of 70, that fall, die, if they would have carried a cane, they'd still be alive. 30%. And uh, another figure that's scary as hell to me is over 40% of women in the United States are attacked. I was talking to a couple of FBI ladies uh, last month out of when I was in New York, and they said that 40% is probably a low number. They say it's close to the 50% of women are attacked. And uh, the cane, I just uh, want to get it out there and let people know that it's not a crutch. It can save your life if you have a balance issue. In fact, I even have balancing exercises. So uh, I was teaching in the hospital one day, and I just for some reason my brain said, ask this question. I said, how many of you people are having balance issues? Every single one of them raised their hand. <laughs> so um, I'm... Uh, uh, my goal is to get the cane and get an exercise system into the hospitals so people understand the cane's not a crutch. It doesn't make them look older. In fact, it uh, it empowers them. So that's that. But I'm going to I'll be doing that until the day I drop. I can't talk. I'm on the phone. Okay. Um, so that's, that's my goal is to get the cane into to, uh, to, to the hospitals and, of course, into the martial arts studios to help them train people. So I can't do it all myself. In fact, with my system, I just kind of use my 
uh, Kane, uh, American Kane says that's an umbrella. And they, uh, people can, uh, can get their own way of teaching and use their own name and just use the umbrella of the American cane system as long as they give me a little bit of credit for showing them how to swing a cane. And that's, uh, that's all I ask for. Mm-hmm. Just uh, get the cane out there and let people know that it's not a crutch. Oh. Because we've got 10,000 people a day turning 65 for the next 14 years. The cane's coming. And uh, we need to get people out there to to teach them. And going back to schools, when you start teaching the cane to a senior, most seniors have kids and grandkids. And they see what's going on in your dojo, and they bring their grandkids over. So it's a win-win situation when you get into the cane. But the cane isn't a fancy tool, so a lot of schools just stay away from it. And they shouldn't. They should be getting into it so they can you know, make it a family, a family fun night exercising and doing cane work at, a, at your local dojo. Well, I can certainly attest to seeing more and more people using the cane in the weapons divisions at the tournaments that we attend and exhibit at or, or I referee at. It's growing and not just in in the older well, that's divisions. That's good to hear. I'm seeing yeah, back more Back in my children. day, I was, I was, yeah, there was very few doing the cane when I was out there back in the late 90s. I, I think uh, my four years... And I I competed probably forty five weekends a year. Wow. Uh, and I maybe uh, went up to about three or four different guys with a cane. Very very little cane use. So I'm glad it's getting out there. Certainly, I, I haven't done too much tournament stuff since I got my rods and bolts to my back. It's, I just haven't done. It. Plus, it's changed a lot. It's not like it used to be. So I just kind of stay away from it. Yeah. And without getting into into details, we can we can talk offline if you prefer. But I know that at least some of those folks that I see are using the cane because of you. I, I, I know I know how it all tracks back, and I know that it tracks back to you. So you are having an impact. I know that for certain. Well, I'm glad I am. I don't know for sure. I just know that I'm doing it. Every day I'm just trying to get the cane out to, to new people so they realize it's not a crutch. And uh, with what's happening overseas, uh, especially when uh, uh, one of our presidents made the uh, getting rewards for kidnapping back into the play, um, you you need to carry something nowadays. It's crazy out there, and uh, what the only thing you can carry legally is the cane. So uh, I'm surprised that more more people aren't doing it. Well, I, but most people don't realize how how nasty that cane can be. Right, right. This is a great time to tell people more about your company, Cane Masters, and and what you're offering, and what people will find, and where to find it, and all that. Commercial time, we call it. So why don't you give us a bit of that? Oh, well, uh, uh, a couple things. I just opened up a virtual dojo. It's called Kane Masters Dojo. And the address of that is Kane, uh, com. And my, uh, main, uh, website is com. We got, it's been up for over 20 years, so it's pretty big and extensive. Um, and then you move into the Warrior Kane Project. If you, uh, know veterans, if you can get a group of 25 veterans, We'll fly out there for free. We'll teach all the veterans for free. We'll give them all a $200 custom wood cane for free. Nothing. There's no charge to the veterans whatsoever. Um, so the Warrior Cane Project, I'm um, real proud that, that I'm working helping Tom out on that project. And that is so important. And the virtual dojo, there's so few cane martial arts schools teaching the cane that uh, I decided to open this virtual dojo. If you can get internet, um, I can be in your living room teaching you. So, and it just opened up last week. Mm-hmm. So we're obviously we're going through our beginning stages, but it's, uh, I've already got uh, quite a few. We start a program I still open up for the, till the, uh, probably the end of next month calling the cane masters founders of the dojo. And we're going to get them into it. If they can teach or want to, they can have, take time into our, uh, virtual dojo and, and teach themselves and get, get there, what they do out there. So instead of just trying to get the cane out there and get everybody to do it. In fact, we started a new uh, community in Facebook called the Cane Masters Community, and we have over 4,300 people signed up in the last four weeks. So the cane's getting out there. People are waking up, and the, and the community is great. I mean, they're getting so many stories. You want to hear a bunch of stories and what's going on, go to the Facebook cane master community and it is amazing what that's doing so uh that's what's going on is the cane masters and 
I like I said, I want to get this out to the hospitals because I have a complete exercise and rehabilitation system with a cane. Um, and uh, it's just helping a lot of people. And that's what I want to do is help people and uh, save a few lives. That's what uh, that's my commercial. Yeah. <laughs> This is all great stuff. Of course, if somebody might be new to the show or you're driving in the car, don't forget, we're going to have all these notes, all the links and everything at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out the episode there with, and, and find everything you need. You don't have to scribble on the back of a gum wrapper while you're driving down the highway. <laughs> yeah, just think of Kane Masters and that's everything. Goes up. Your phone number is 1-800-422-KANE which is 422-2263. So I have an easy phone number. I got an 800 number, and of course, I got the local numbers. But okay, canemasters.com, you'd be surprised what's on there. And design your own cane, and, and we can make you uh, carry a cane you're proud to carry. That's great. That's my commercial. Well, sir, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for your time. And if I could trouble you with one more thing, we always ask our guests to leave us with some Parting words of wisdom, some advice, if you will, for all for everyone that's tuned in. What would your advice be to all of us? My advice would be uh, exercise, stay in shape, uh, learn how to do some yoga, learn how to get your chi to flow, and uh, enjoy your life. And when you uh, want to do something, set your mind to it and go for it. You set your mind to do something, you can do it. That, that's how it works. Uh, the martial arts teaches you how to set your mind and go after stuff. I mean, uh, that's what happened to me. I mean, I didn't get my first grand championship till I was 52 years old. So it's all a mindset. Set your mind to do something and go after it. And the martial arts and yoga can help you do both of that. Honestly, I find the use of the cane absolutely ingenious. Grandmaster Shuey, while he certainly wasn't the first, you know, he, he's turned something that's really inconspicuous, an object that's generally reserved as a tool for people who struggle to walk. He's embraced it as a tool of self-defense, as a tool for personal development, as a martial arts weapon. And I love that. And I don't know of anything that's really more martial arts than that. I feel like that fact alone tells you so much about Grandmaster Shuey and his willingness to think outside the box and consider the world in a way that others just won't or, or choose not to. Thank you, Grandmaster Shuey, for coming on the show. I really enjoyed our time. If you want, you can check out the show notes. I hope you do at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We have links to the things Grandmaster Shuey has going on, his website, social media, the other stuff that the other stuff that you may want to learn about in regards to the cane. There's a lot there. You can check out our social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, YouTube. We're also dabbling in Pinterest, Google+, Tumblr, and a bunch of other stuff because we're trying to reach you wherever you are and bring you what you want. Don't forget to check out our sparring boots, the Whistlekick original sparring boots, the best sparring boot available at whistlekick.com. If you operate a school and you want to bring some of those in at a discounted price, aka wholesale, so you can share them with your students, we would love to have you as a wholesale customer. You can check out wholesale.whistlekick.com or there's just a link from whistlekick.com. Like I said, whistlekick.com, start there. You'll get to everything that you need. Thanks again for tuning in today. I appreciate your time. This is Jeremy signing off and reminding you to train hard, smile, and have a great day.